Hello, and welcome to the Broken Rails New Social Environment. I'm Sophia, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today. A few quick notes before we get to started on today's very exciting talk. We'll be recording this meeting for the Rail Archive. If you would prefer not to be seen, you can disable your camera by pressing the stop video button in the bottom left corner of your screen. We'll keep the audience on mute until question time, which I will kick off about halfway through the talk. The Rail team will be helping out with tech if you have questions and our production assistants, Malvika and Miko, will be typing closed captions to make our talk accessible. We will close with a poem as is traditional at the rail. And now with no further ado, I introduce Paul Maddock, our politics editor in the field notes sections of the rail. Hi, thank you, Sophia. And could you still get rid of that little waiting room sign? It's blocking my view, thanks. I'm very excited today to welcome an old friend, teacher, and inspiration, Noam Chomsky, to these discussions. Uh, I can't think of a more interesting and important person to discuss the ongoing events with. And rather than waste a lot of time telling you all who he is, because you all know he's probably the world's most important and well-known linguist, and probably at the moment, the world's most important and well-known left-wing political commentator. Uh, so that said, I welcome you, Noam. And I want to start by asking you a question. You, when I first contacted you, you said, I've never been so busy. This is an, a, an amazing moment that, that there is a constant stream of things to talk about and people who want to talk. What are the special challenges of the current situation? Why is this moment so particularly important? Well, this moment is particularly important for reasons that are not being discussed. Uh, of course, quite naturally and properly, uh, everyone is consumed by the immediate crisis, the coronavirus, COVID-19. Everyone's shut down, the, uh, people are losing their jobs, people are dying, uh, the economy is collapsing, uh, people who are paying attention are sequestered. So of course, they're paying attention to that. But we're going to recover from this crisis somehow after lots of uh, pain, cost, uh, deaths, uh, be a miserable time that we will recover. We're not going to recover from other things that are happening right now, like the melting of the uh, polar ice caps or the uh, opening the uh, uh, opening of the ending of the uh, regime that has somewhat protected us from terminal nuclear war it's being dismantled before our eyes by the white house uh, that's these are things we're not going to recover from in fact we'll be lucky if we survive uh, as the uh, and uh, those who are Concerned that there, there is, there are, we're all told that we should just pay attention to the immediate crisis, not think about the future. Uh, there are those who are thinking about the future. Uh, for example, the fossil fuel companies and their agent in the White House, they're thinking about the future. They're planning to create a world which is harsher and more brutal than the one that we are now that has brought us the current crisis so they don't relent they keep at it all the time and if we let them forge the future world we'll be in even deeper trouble so take uh, the president's budget for the next year which symbolized very well what uh, the ruling classes have in mind uh, take a look at the president's budget mid-february pandemic is raging, uh, what does it call for? Cut back in funding for the Center for Disease Control. Uh, throughout Trump's term, he's been cutting it every year, uh, also destroying programs that could have protected the US from the crisis, leaving us uniquely vulnerable. So the first point in the budget is, let's make it worse. Let's defund the things that might protect the population from a 
a health crisis and a future pandemic, which is very likely. However, the budget did call for increased expenses in some areas. One, increased subsidies to fossil fuel corporations. Okay, so on the one hand, let's continue to reduce any protections for the population. On the other hand, let's continue to accelerate the race to the abyss with global warming. But that'll be profitable for the fuel companies and it'll uh, help my electoral chances. Uh, more funding for the bloated military, uh, which already outspends practically the entire world. And of course, more funding for his famous wall. Uh, why? Because uh, that raise a boat among deluded people who think that the miserable refugees fleeing from our atrocities in Central America are a danger to them. So that's the mentality of the uh, those who are trying to shape the world in the interests of profit, power, and corporate power, and so on. But they don't relent. They keep going. Okay. Uh, now, if you ask what we should be, uh, what we should we should be asking the urgent question we should be asking the immediate one is why did this pandemic come in the first place we should be asking that and scientists are well aware that if we don't deal with those causes another one is going to come which will be even worse because it'll be intensified by the global warming that's proceeding while we're talking so what are the roots of this crisis? They're not very subtle. Uh, to deal with them won't be simple, but they're pretty obvious on the surface. It begins with a crisis of uh, a, 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 a crisis of the and of the inherent logic of capitalism. Okay, it was known right after the SARS crisis, two thousand three, uh, which fortunately was contained. Now, scientists were perfectly well aware, were openly saying, there's another one coming, probably another coronavirus, unless we plan for it. Well, who can plan for it? Now, the obvious answer is uh, the drug corporations. Uh, <laughs> overwhelmed with funds, uh, given huge gifts in the uh, World Trade Organization, uh, ludicrously called free trade agreements, highly protectionist investor rights agreements, which give them just pour money into their pockets. They're overflowing with money. They have all the resources. So why don't they do it? Because there's something called capitalism. You're supposed to make profits. If you're a corporation, your one job is to increase profit and market share. And of course, high salaries for the CEO and management. In fact, we can go right back to Milton Friedman, the guru of the neoliberal period we've been suffering through for 40 years since Friedman. He made it very clear that uh, the goal of business with a corporation is greed, maximize profit for the shareholders, the wealthy shareholders that are wealthy, and uh, management. Anything else you do shakes the foundations of civilization. So they can't do it. Uh, you make more money uh, on things you can sell tomorrow than on planning for a severe crisis that might come in a few years. So they're out of it. Well, there's another possible uh, agent who could become involved, the government. Uh, most basic research, uh, but main research in almost all areas, including the technology that we're now using, comes from public funding, uh, the national institutes, uh, research universities, and so on. So the government could do it. But there's an impediment. It's called neoliberalism, a particularly savage form of capitalism. Uh, we all remember uh, Ronald Reagan's inaugural speech, which is sunny smile telling us that uh, government is the problem not the solution and to translate that into english it means 
that we should take decisions away from the government, which has a flaw that's partially accountable to people. And we should place decisions in the hands of private tyrannies, which are totally unaccountable to the people. Okay? That's Ronald Reagan reading the script handed to him by his corporate master. So the government can't enter. That's the second blow. Then comes the third. Then comes the third. Uh, I should say every country was suffering from the first two. But then comes uh, virtually everyone. Then comes the third. How different countries react to it. They did react differently. Now, I've already mentioned how Trump reacted namely through his four years when information was coming all the time to cut funding for the Center for Disease Control to cancel programs that were including programs for scientists in China that were preparing for this, cut all that. Okay, then comes the crisis. Uh, let's go through it because there's a tremendous amount of lying about it going on now. Uh, the facts are not controversial. On uh, December 31st, uh, China informed the World Health Organization that they were beginning to see pneumonia-like symptoms of an unusual kind with an unknown etiology. About a week later, very rapidly, the Chinese scientists had identified the source. They had identified the virus. Uh, by January 10th, they had sequenced, provided the information about the genome to the entire world. And then comes the question how countries react. Some reacted very quickly and effectively. Uh, the countries in the uh, East Asian periphery, and so Taiwan, South Korea, New Zealand, uh, Australia, they all reacted quite quickly and they have the disease pretty much under control. Now, Europe, at first, didn't pay much attention to these Asians. But then they finally started in varying ways of having one way or another got it beginning to get it under control, some pretty effectively. Uh, Britain, at first, uh, followed a course that was suicidal, but they quickly reversed course. And now are moving in the same direction. Then comes the bottom of the barrel, the United States, Donald Trump and his administration. They did nothing. Uh, it's not that they didn't know. They were getting constant, insistent briefings. In fact, we now have learned daily urgent ones from the intelligence agencies saying there's a serious crisis. I'm hearing it from health agencies, or health officials. But uh, Trump was busy looking at his TV. Uh, it, was just, it was just a cold sniff of his little legs. Well, uh, tens of thousands of Americans are dying. Uh, right now, the, the United States is the epicenter of the crisis, still growing. Uh, finally, in March, uh, something got through to, through to Trump. My suspicion is, can't prove it, that it was the decline, sharp decline in the stock market. That's something yes, I think that's correct. Probably yes. that's what it did. Anyway, he noticed. But then we hear a different thing. Uh, I was the first person in the world to discover it, to know, recognize that it was a pandemic. It's my super genius. I've got everything in hand. Turn on Fox News that evening. Sean Hannity will tell you it's the most brilliant decision in the history of the universe. And then we go on to the next phase, which is trying to find scapegoats. Let's try to find some way to cover up from the crimes you are committing against the American people. So for, first, it's China. You know, China's responsible. Now, look at the newspapers this morning. You know, Trump is fuming. It says he's trying to figure out ways to punish China and take away their sovereign immunity so everybody in the country can sue them. Let's sue them for billions of dollars you know, for things that didn't happen for our crimes. Next was the World Health Organization. 
it's uh, China centric. Uh, we, we provide it with 10 times the funds of China, but China's so powerful that they control it. So it's the World Health Organization. I won't even bother looking at the arguments, they're so ludicrous. But the effect is not ludicrous. Uh, Trump defunded the World Health Organization. And, what, and he is now, as we now know, his administration is moving to destroy it. Uh, what does that mean? That means that unknown numbers of poor, suffering people in Africa are going to die. They are reliant on World Health Organization uh, expertise and doctors or treatment, uh, not for the coronavirus, that's still coming, but for many other diseases. So let's kill lots of black Africans because it might improve my electoral standing. Okay, that's the next one. And uh, it goes on from there, we can continue. You know, a couple of days ago, uh, Trump uh, fired the uh, uh, head, the scientist who's in the head of heads of vaccine development in the United States. He had a reason. Uh, the, the scientist dared to make some critical comments about the quack medicines he's trying to I mean, that's what we're living with. So three so, major problems. Yep. Ahead, I want to three major problems. The logic of capitalism, the particularly savage form of capitalism called neoliberalism, and a gang of criminals in the White House of an unusual sort. And given these three causal factors, if you want to call them that, or three different sort of levels of agency, the system as a whole, its particularly virulent contemporary form, and the particularly horrible bunch of people that are running it in the United States. What do you see as the openings for people to react and to deal with the situation with which the Earth's population is now being faced by this development? What should we do? The immediate thing is to get rid of the malignancy in the White House that's poisoning us and will continue to in worse ways. The second thing is to join those, uh, the masters who are working to create a future society in their interest, join them and work against them work to oppose these forces. It can be done domestically, can be done internationally. So just to give at home, that means continuing the activism that has been going on, that was kind of uh, coalesced in the Sanders campaign, I mean, the kinds of activism that have been underway and very successful. The Sanders campaign, contrary to what people say, has been a surprising success. It's, uh, it's first of all, initiated programs that are enormously significant. So uh, we're going to have to have some form of Green New Deal if we want to survive. A couple of years ago, this was often a way off in the distance. So, if mentioned, it was ridiculed. And now it's in the center of the legislative agenda. And what happened? And young active, a group of young activists, Sunrise Movement, uh, pressed forward with their campaign for it, uh, occupied senatorial offices, uh, congressional offices. Now they got some support from the young congressional representatives who were swept into office on the Sanders wave, especially Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, uh, senator, senator from Massachusetts, said Markey, he'd been interested in climate issues, joined, and now it's on the agenda. Okay, that's a big change. That kind of activism has to continue, and it has had an effect. Uh, uh, Joe Biden is not my favorite person, to put it mildly, but if you look at his program, it's well to the left of any program of a preceding a Democratic candidate, not 
because it was the choice of the DNC, but because they're forced to it by the shift of the popular base to an activist uh, left. That has to continue. Uh, there is a traditional left position on elections, which seems to have faded into the woodwork, but we should revive it. Now, the traditional position is they don't matter that much. Now, what matters is your ongoing activist work, which should be just as relentless as the work of the masters. If it isn't, we're in trouble to be more diligent. Uh, every once in a while, uh, an event occurs called an election, uh, which uh, you should spend many, maybe 15 minutes on. Uh, you take a look at the electoral choices handed to you, you say, ask, uh, is there a significant difference? Uh, if there is, I'll take off a couple of minutes and push a lever in the voting booth and then go back to my work. If there isn't, I'll ignore it or vote for a third party or do something else. Now that's what we should be doing. It's had an effect. We know it can have an effect. Uh, public action and initiative and activism has had effects on uh, Richard Nixon, on Ronald Reagan, on uh, any half-human president. It won't have an effect on Donald Trump. He's going to be rock, he and the people around him will be rock solid in opposition. I'm referring to people who are half human, who care for the country to some extent, not just for themselves. So that's the kind of thing we should be doing, thinking about the looming crises that are not far ahead and that are much more serious than, the, than even this pandemic. Again, the grim effects of ongoing global warming, the terrible threat of nuclear war, which is being raised by the destruction of the arms control regime, by provocative military operations on the Russian border, uh, by the, uh, in the Middle East, we should talk about this. The, one of Trump's crimes has been to dismantle the Iran uh, agreement. That's very serious. The whole world is against it. Uh, he had to do it because it was Obama's agreement and therefore he has to do the opposite. It's one of the few principles of the Trump administration. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, it's raising the prospects of, first of all, it's extremely harmful to the people. I should say that uh, tightening the sanctions against Iran, which are illegitimate in the first place, the tightening in the midst of a pandemic is just savagery beyond words. But it's also raising seriously the threat of war. There are simple ways around it. You should discuss them. They're not being discussed. Those are the kinds of things that activists should be pressing for. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to say, just to follow up on this, that this is in many ways an unprecedented situation, both the climate catastrophe on the way and then the shutdown of the world economy in response to a pandemic. This is something that's never happened before, but as you said, the more serious danger that lies behind it is also a, no a historical novelty. But one of the important things that I see you as bringing to this moment is an enormous historical knowledge and an, a long personal knowledge of activism and political activity. What would you say that young people need to keep in mind as resources to draw on in meeting these challenges in confronting Trump, in confronting neoliberalism, and in confronting the dangers of climate change? Where should people look? You know, what are the tools that are available uh, insofar as you can draw on your experience and knowledge of the past to suggest what paths that people need to take in the future? Just take the things we've just been talking about. Uh, the activity of a small group of young people in the Sunrise Movement to place on the agenda something that's essential for survival. 
It's not a small move. Uh, take the uh, the climate strike last October. It's very significant. Actually, uh, for educational purposes, one thing that should be shown in every classroom in the country, in every uh, public meeting, I think, is one of the most dramatic uh, events that I can recall in my lifetime. It was the meeting of the Davos conference in January. Every January, the rich and powerful, the people who call themselves the masters of the universe, get together and see the uh, <laughs> corporations and so on, go skiing in Davos, Switzerland, and talk to each other about how wonderful they are and so on. Well, it's a kind of an important meeting. This last January, the meeting opened with two talks, two keynote addresses. The first one, of course, was Donald Trump. Uh, it's worth listening to, uh, ranting and raving about how brilliant he is and how wonderful he is and how awful everyone else is and so on. And it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, the people at Davis don't really like him. He uh, spoils their, his vulgarity spoils their image of the dedicated humanists who want to help the world and so on. But though they don't like him, they give him rousing applause because he understands something that they know is crucial. Whose pockets to fill with dollars? He understands that. So he can be a vulgar thug, but as long as he devotes himself full time to enriching the very rich and, and corporate power, they'll accept it. So rousing applause for uh, Donald Trump. Then came the second talk, 17 year old girl, Greta Thunberg, gave a quiet, serious, factual talk, accurate, ending by talking to the people there and saying, you are betraying us. Polite applause, pat her on the head, nice little girl, go back to school. We've got it in hand, don't worry. That should be shown everywhere. It's very striking. And it's the kind of answer to your the question you raised. Mm -hmm. Greta Thunberg representing the people of the world, especially the young people, and this malignancy uh, being cheered by people like him who want to increase their wealth and power and control. And that's the world. There's an old phrase for it called class conflict. Uh, but if you don't want to use that phrase, call something else. But that's where we stand. And which one is going to prevail? If one of them has all the wealth and the power. The other has all the people. If they do something, not if they don't. And that's, that's what is significant. I should say this is also happening quietly, though it should be up front on the international scale. Uh, you take the Trump administration, it's mostly chaotic. It's hard to detect uh, some kind of thinking behind it other than me. But, you know. but there is some geostrategic planning. Uh, it's the basic idea is to construct a reactionary international, an international of the most reactionary states, led by the White House, of course. It'll include uh, Brazil under Bolsonaro, who's a small clone of Trump. Uh, it will uh, include the family dictatorships in the, uh, in the Gulf region, Saudi Arabia, UAE, brutal dictatorships. Uh, it will include Egypt uh, under the worst, harshest dictatorship it's in its history, the al Sisi dictatorship, who's a, incidentally a great friend of Trump, one tells us include Israel moving so far to the right that you need a telescope to see it at this point, uh, making, by now making public the tacit links it's had for many years with the Gulf dictatorship. So going a little to the east, it'll include uh, India under Modi, who's trying to dismantle what's left of Indian secular democracy and uh, introduce a 
a hin alpha Hindu ultra right nationalist uh, regime uh, who nice people like uh, Orban in Hungary uh, turning what was a democracy into dictatorship. Uh, and Mario Salvini in uh, Italy who gets his kicks out of helping refugees from Africa drown in the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, another range, range of such states and individuals. And that's the reactionary international. That's being formed before our eyes. But as I said, they're relentless. They don't stop. And meanwhile, there's another one being formed. It doesn't get any publicity, but it's important. The Progressive International is having its opening meeting uh, a couple of weeks, I think May 11th. It was initiated by Bernie Sanders and uh, Yanis Varoufakis, the left economist in Europe, a good economist, uh, who's uh, founded a group called DM25, which is a Europe-wide uh, activist political group uh, trying to salvage what's worth saving in the European Union and get rid of the rot in the European Union. So these two groups are getting together. They want to bring in the global south, uh, in fact, most of the world. So we have two internationals for me. Uh, one of them, power, wealth, states, and the other, people. And that's an international analog to the domestic conflict at home. So these things are continuing and plenty of opportunities, you know. Uh, we're not living in totalitarian states. We have a lot of freedom. You know, there's repression, but you know, compared to what other people face, so uh, invisible. You know, so we can do lots of things, uh, but you have to do them. And uh, that means even doing things like pressing levers. So why isn't Trump, why isn't Sanders the Democratic nominee? Uh, what happened during the primaries? Well, one thing that happened, and we should pay attention to it, is uh, Sanders was hoping for a surge of young people who were his ardent supporters. Didn't happen. They didn't vote. But it's not a big deal, as I said. It's a minor interruption of activist activities. But it's an important inter uh, uh, interruption. You don't use that those 15 minutes, you're getting, you're changing what happens significantly. And young people didn't. Let's take a lesson from that too. Say it. One, I'm, one thing that you haven't mentioned is, but with something which has struck me at that present, is the upsurge of, speaking of people, the upsurge of act activism among rank and file workers all over the United States as well as other countries. Um, Starting tomorrow, and, there's a major general strike tomorrow with lots of groups uh, entering. I mean, the labor movement was one of the first priorities of the neoliberal capitalism is to destroy the labor movement because that's the, has always been the main force that brings people together and is in the forefront of social progressive social change. So we got to get rid of them. And they understood it. You know, take uh, Reagan and the United States, Thatcher in England. The first move were to undermine the labor movement. Uh, Reagan went as far as to bring in scabs unheard of. It's illegal in almost every country. But I think South Africa and the United States are the only South of the apartheid in the United States, the only countries that even tolerate it. So bring in scabs to bring, uh, undermine strikes and on from there. Uh, private uh, corporations quickly picked up you know, the mantle once they saw the door was open. So Caterpillar and others joined in, great strikes with scabs and intimidation. Then Clinton comes along with his own techniques and destroy labor and on. The labor was seriously beaten back, but it's coming back, coming back in very interesting ways. It started with 
non-union activities in the red states, in the West Virginia teacher strikes, mm -hmm. teacher strikes. Now, these are you know, not pro-labor states. Uh, now it's spread to the major uh, industrial unions and others. And uh, uh, my old friends, the IWW, have been one of the few members of, is reviving. It's uh, on uh, Friday, tomorrow, there's supposed to be a day of major labor actions. Some of them have been very significant. So Amazon workers who are treated with unusual brutality uh, have been carrying out labor actions for some time and they've been effective. Uh, one of them got Jeff Bezos to the head, uh, who owns the place, to uh, uh, pledge, uh, I think, uh, $10 million, which is pennies for him, but otherwise significant to, pet, to uh, pledge it for actions against uh, global warming and to pledge to turn Amazon into a carbon free emitter in some period. Those are changes. Now that came from what militancy of Amazon workers. Now they're continuing. In fact, they're central to tomorrow's strikes and other things are happening. So yes, that's restoring and reviving, revitalizing the labor movement. Essential importance. And then I can go back to my own childhood in the 1930s, uh, 1920s, uh, labor had been crushed by Woodrow Wilson and his Red Purge, but it revived. And that's what led to the New Deal. Uh, workers began, uh, I, my early memories, I've seen uh, workers on strike out of outside textile plants and so on. It even moved on by the mid thirties to sit down strikes. Sit down strikes are very frightening uh, to the owners because a sit down strike is just one step before saying, we don't need the bosses. We can take it over and run it ourselves. It's a fragile system of domination and control, and it could collapse. Well, when you get to the point of sit down strikes, then you start getting measures. And the measures were significant, very significant, changed life enormously, uh, made major effects that lasted until really until the late 70s and Ronald Reagan. Uh, very short of what should be done, but nevertheless quite significant. Changed the world much to the better. Uh, well, that can happen again. I think that this might be a good time to ask for a few questions. There's so many people are watching and listening in that obviously very few people are going to be able to speak. But this might be a moment to uh, ask our guests uh, to propose questions which haven't yet been addressed. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. Um, I will be moderating technically the uh, Q&A portion. And I'm first going to call upon Jeremy Ziller to ask a question. Jeremy, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Sophia. And uh, thank you, Noam and Paul. Um, I had a question. So from my perspective, the rising complexity of technology and the systems that are coming about um, and the lack of visibility into the decisions that the technology and these systems are now making on our behalf, from my perspective, is one of the biggest rising problems that's not being talked about. And one of my assumptions in doing, and I do a lot of this, this work myself, one of my assumptions is that the, the language and greater transparency has a significant role to play in making digital services more inclusive and more equitable and more accessible. Um, so do you have any advice for individuals on how they can bring about change to, ri uh, to counter rising complexity? Well, the complexity is real, but uh, it is not out of the range of the general public to 
sufficiently understand, not the details, but to get the basic idea. So there are two things to do. One is to impose, to, for, I gather that you're part of the technology culture. So inside it, compel the industries to become transparent, uh, like the Amazon workers who forced changes in the Amazon uh, system. Again, nowhere near enough, but significant ones. Uh, people working for uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, Apple, and others can be doing the same kinds of things from the inside. Uh, for the gym, for the, everyone else, force them by public pressure, uh, public activism, uh, banging on the doors, uh, you know, the traditional image of the peasants with their pitchforks, and uh, force them to respond. And they do. They have to respond to public pressure. And so, for example, there was a leaked memo from a J.P. Morgan Chase recently, biggest bank in the United States. Very interesting memo. It said, the course we're following is going to uh, end, place at risk the survival of humanity. Uh, and the bank has to think about changing its policies of funding fossil fuels because we are under reputational risk. Well, what does that mean? Those are the peasants with the pitchforks. Uh, we <laughs> have to maintain some sort of image to them if we want to keep control. Otherwise, they're going to get rid of us. Uh, why should we have banks like this? Why not have public banks, which the public runs and owns? Uh, so we have to be concerned about reputational risks. So from the outside, there's plenty of pressures. From the inside, there's work to be done. Uh, maybe these huge monopolies should just be broken up. Maybe they should even be placed under public control. Maybe they should have workers on their board. Uh, all sorts of things that can be done. But you're right, these are serious problems. Technology is complex. You don't expect uh, everyone in the world to understand the intricacies of uh, deep learning, let's say. In fact, even the technologists don't understand them, they're too opaque. Uh, but you can understand enough so as, uh, so, so as to carry out meaningful uh, activities to deal with the problem. And you're right, it's a serious problem. Um, the degree of control over us that uh, a couple of corporations have, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, Apple, and others, is astonishing. I mean, there's a, one of the things that's under going on now, which is, well, I don't want to take too much time, so I'll just mention it, is what's called surveillance capitalism massive surveillance of every person, everything you do. You have a cell phone, uh, there's information pouring out every minute, whether you want it to or not, uh, to the central corporations, which are control amassing it. You drive a car, uh, the electronics in the car is sending out information to the uh, car manufacturers. Of course, it's all given point point to Big Brother on top as well. Uh, this is when you get to the uh, Internet of Things, so called, you know, the refrigerator has electronics on it. Uh, everything around you is going to be collecting information. And that information is for domination and control. So it's something very much to be concerned about. Yeah, and that information that's coming in those devices is going to multiple parties that are making, helping to make decisions so it's no longer you can call an organization and refute a claim it's now you're now 10 steps removed from the entity which in some ways in a lot of ways removes the need for reputation absolutely um, there's even experiments beginning actually began in sweden but it's moving here to place chips in worker uh, the inducement is if you have a chip you can get a coat at the machine or something. But of course, what the chip does is give information to the bosses. Uh, this is an advanced form of what used to be called Taylorism. You know, control every action that every worker makes uh, so that you get uh, maximal
profit, uh, maximal control. You know, we go back to the 19th century, a business enterprise had a guy sitting in a chair watching the, you know, the women at the, at the sewing machines, making sure they were working. But now it's advanced uh, way beyond uh, chips and workers. Uh, this is uh, the next step towards a uh, real dystopia. But all of these things are around and they're, in, they're monopolized in very few hands, very few powerful hands. Of course, the government. Do we have another question? Oh, yes, we have many questions. Um, <laughs> a lot of excited guests here ready to speak with you. Next, I'm going to go to Miko. Miko, you are now unmuted. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, hi, Noam. Thank you. And Paul, thanks, everybody. Thank um, you. My, um, my question is. Um, it has to do with funding. Um, let me just find it. <laughs> so with so many anti-climate um, change movements and conservative sociopaths getting mass corporate funding, how do you think it will be possible, if it's possible, to fuel democracy? Essentially, how can we get funding for democracy? Or do we even need funding? There's something called people. Actually, one of the major contributions of the Sanders campaign was to break with over a century of American political history in which elections are pretty much bought. Sometimes there's very good work in academic political science. Uh, Thomas Ferguson's brain person has done it. You should look up his work which shows quite effectively that you can predict the outcome of an election and pretty much just by looking at campaign funding. It goes back to the 19th century. It's really taken off in recent years. Uh, Sanders broke with that. He's the first person to come very close to winning a nomination and possibly the election. Didn't quite happen, but it came remarkably close with no funding from the corporate sector, no funding from private wealth, no support from the media, which hated him, just support from people. Okay, shows it can be done. It's not the first time that the labor movement didn't get corporate funding, the civil <laughs> rights movement didn't get corporate funding when freedom riders were being killed in the South. Uh, the women's movement didn't get corporate funding. And people can do things. And they have to understand that. And that's how positive change has always taken place. It doesn't take place because some rich guy decides, let's make the world better. And it comes from that kind of relentless pressure that we've been talking about. And it works. We've seen that it works. Sanders made it very clear that it can even work in the political system. So I think, uh, saying before, on one side there's wealth, uh, violence, uh, power. On the other side, there's people. They, they can win if they act and get together. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Next, we will head over to Raymond Foy. Raymond, I'm unmuting you now. Uh, Mr. Chomsky, uh, is it time to read Thomas Malthus again? Does he have anything to say about this present moment? About uh, overpopulation and the yes. risk? That's a problem, serious problem. But like every other problem that exists, we know how to solve it. There's a very simple solution to the problem of overpopulation. It's called education of women it has been remarkably effective from rich countries to poor countries from germany and japan to kerala and india one of the poorest parts of india but which happens to have been run i hesitate to say the words in the united states you could say it in other countries it's been run by the communist party in uh, india for a long time which has introduced progressive legislation 
one of them is education of women, so that the reading population is declining. Uh, in fact, in the wealthy countries, the population is declining so fast that it's becoming a problem, a labor shortage. Uh, it's not a panacea, but it's a very essential and simple uh, move to deal with the Malthus problem. Now, of course, there are other things like uh, providing uh, assembly uh, assistance programs, uh, health care, you know, uh, information about family planning, all of those things. Now, that has a big effect. Uh, notice that that's being killed not only by the Trump administration, but by the whole far right in the United States. It's kind of striking to see people you know, militantly opposing any, uh, uh, any possible uh, right of abortion, at the same time actively increasing the worst kinds of abortions, illegal abortions. You don't have family planning, you're going to have illegal abortions. Dangerous. Uh, here, and then you go to a country place like Africa and murder it. So we expand, uh, we expand population, we expand illegal abortions, uh, all in order to uh, win some points for elections here. I should say there's an interesting fact about the Republicans and uh, abortion. You go back to the 60s and early 70s, the leading figures in the Republican Party, like Ronald Reagan, uh, George H.W. Bush, were all what we now call pro-choice, uh, strongly in fact. Uh, Reagan, when he was governor of California in the 60s, passed one of the most advanced uh, legislations to uh, offer rights of women for abortion. And what happened? In the mid-70s, a Republican strategist, Paul Weirich, got an idea. He realized that if the Republican Party prete pretends, I stress, pretends to be opposed to abortion, they can pick up the huge evangelical vote and the vote of Northern Catholics. So on a dime, everybody switched, militantly anti-abortion. That's the way politics works, and many other things like that. But there are things to do, that's the point. It's a real problem, you're right. There are solutions, easily within reach. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for joining us again, Raymond. So uh, next we will go over to Joan Key. Joan, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question. Uh, hello, thank you so much for um, sharing with us your time and your insights. Um, I just wanted to, I'm also asking on behalf of my 90 year old father who um, was part of this, the movement that uh, led to democracy in South Korea in 1987. What explains the inability of the left wing to unseat Trump, Johnson, and so many others, the counter humans like them? Because despite, we, we have such a collective pool of brilliance of such great minds, but there hasn't been really any sort of massive, persistent, or coordinated action that would overturn this Nero-like regime. And I'm sorry I've been getting a little bit uh, emotional, but this, um, what you've said has really struck a chord. Well, first of all, Partly it's what I said before. The, for, uh, notice incidentally that in the 2016 election, as you know, I'm sure, uh, uh, Trump lost the popular vote by quite a lot, up to several million. Uh, the right wing Republicans these days are well aware that they're a minority party. Uh, that's why they're turning over heaven and earth to keep people from voting like in Georgia, and Stacey Abrams probably would have won the last election. But the guy in charge of the election commission happened to be her opponent, and he just blocked huge numbers of African-American votes. Uh, there's uh, efforts to destroy uh, Mitch McConnell and his accomplices are doing everything they can to cut back on 
voting rights to make it harder for the wrong kind of people, namely poor black people to vote and so on. Uh, the, uh, I should mention something, uh, something more, uh, there's the other factor that I just mentioned about how elections generally are bought and we know who pays for them. Uh, there's another general point that isn't discussed very much. Uh, it's not even researched very much, it should be. Look, some years ago, a very good political scientist who works on elections and so on, Walter Dean Burnham, made a very interesting, very, carried out a very interesting study. He, take a look, he took a look at non-voters in the United States. About half the population doesn't bother voting in an off-year elections anymore. Uh, he looked at their socioeconomic profiles, you know, who are they? And he compared them with Europe. Turns out it's very similar to the socioeconomic profiles of Europeans who vote for social democratic and laborite parties. Same kind of people here don't vote. Why? Well, one thought comes to mind, because there's nobody for them to vote for, okay? So they don't vote. Well, that tells you something to be done. Uh, you can try to create uh, the kinds of social democratic parties that exist elsewhere in the world. For me, that's, I'm sure for Paul, obviously, that's nowhere near enough, but at least it's something. Uh, the United States, I mean, you want to take a look at the United States, think of it for a minute. It's off the spectrum in all sorts of ways. Now take a look at Sanders' main programs, uh, universal health care, free higher education. Can you think of any other country that has universal health care? Uh, can you think of any country that doesn't have it? You have to look hard. Almost everybody has it. Rich countries, poor countries. And the same with universal health care, you know, the free higher education. You know, the other wealthy countries mostly have it. The poor countries like Mexico have it. So what Sanders is saying is, let's see if we can rise to the level of other countries. In the United States, that's considered revolutionary. You know, too radical for Americans to accept. What does that tell you about the reigning culture? We're very much a business-run society. We have two business parties, one more dedicated to business, one a little more open to the public. We're very much unlike other countries. That's an opening for activists. Let's do something about it, starting with your neighbors, uh, your community, uh, your states, uh, on and on. Change it into a modern country that can have the things that other countries have and then go on. Now, there are advantages here. In many ways, this is an, uh, this is an unusually free country. There's limitations, but comparatively speaking, it's very free, even as compared with the other advanced countries. Okay. That offers plenty of options. Uh, it's got a long history of uh, real serious activism, things like the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the anti-war movement, uh, the Central America solidarity movements are something that has never happened in the history of imperialism. There's never been a time in the whole history of imperialism when people from the mainstream you know, churches in Kansas, elsewhere, went to countries that we were attacking to try to help the victims. That has never happened in the entire history of imperialism. It happened here. So there's plenty of good things here to build on, plenty of bad things to overcome. That gives you the opportunities to do something. They're there, but you have to pick them up and take them. Thank you very much. Um, next, we will head over to Mark. Mark, I'm going to unmute you. Hello. Um, I thank you for taking time uh, for us today. This is a tremendous uh, uh, opportunity for all of us. 
Um, I wanted to talk about something more specific. Um, what should we have done to prevent the Merrick Garland disaster, the failed Garland nomination to the Supreme Court? Um, in my opinion, this was, uh, uh, you know, it had ramifications way beyond its immediate uh, 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 circumstance. And I ask this because because this happened, it can happen again. And, uh, you know, it has, it has a ripple, uh, a very scary ripple uh, effect. Um, what can we do to prevent this from happening again, or better yet, to correct this? Well, there's one immediate thing, and that is to vote the Republicans out of office. Um, the Republican Party used to be a political party. I mean, I have go back to the 60s. Uh, I voted for a Republican congressman because they happened to be the ones most amenable to uh, work on the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. But they used to be a political party. And that changed, uh, starting with uh, Newt, started with Reagan to an extent, but then particularly with Newt Gingrich, uh, Dennis Hastert, uh, and particularly Mitch McConnell, who's the real evil genius of this administration. The Republicans just went off the rails. They're no longer a normal parliamentary party. I gave an example with, uh, and let me just give you an example on climate change. Uh, you go back to 2008, uh, uh, McCain was running for president. But he had uh, mild uh, uh, global warming, planks in his platform. Now, the Republicans in Congress were beginning to slowly towards some attention to global war. What happened? Now, the Koch brothers, huge, monstrous uh, energy corporation, had been working for years to try to prevent the, this heresy from developing in the Republican Party. Now, they came in like a juggernaut, uh, bribing senators, intimidating other senators, threats of running opposing candidates, a huge lobbying campaign, AstroTurf did everything. The party collapsed. They all became climate change deniers. Well, that's pressure from the right. And what you pointed to is something extremely important. One of their efforts to try to hold on to power even though they're a minority organization, and they're gonna become more of a minority organization, one of the ways is to stuff the courts all the way up, not just the Supreme Court, all the way through the judiciary with young ultra-right lawyers who will be sitting there for a generation and will able to be able to block any mild implementation of any mildly progressive legislation. That's one, and the Garland case was a striking example. Mitch McConnell, as of course you know, simply would not let it come to a confirmation hearing. Uh, he said, no, we're not gonna let Obama appoint anyone. It was not just Garland, lots of other cases. Uh, since he controls the Senate um, and his party has just abandoned parliamentary politics, uh, he was able to stop uh, most of uh, Obama's appointments. Now, Obama was not appointing uh, less liberal justices. He was appointing centrist moderates. But they don't want that. They want people on the far right, all the way up and down the line. And uh, one of the results of another four years of Trump will be that we'll have succeeded. Uh, they'll have the judiciary so much under control that no matter what people want, uh, they, they'll be blocked at the, uh, the Congress, at the uh, governmental level. That's part of the effort to maintain control for concentrated private power, corporate power, private wealth, even though they're losing the population. So yes, what you pointed to is very significant. It's a crucial incident in a major movement that's going on. And will continue if they can hold on to power. That's one of the reasons they're 
trying so desperately to cut back voting, you know, making uh, onerous restrictions that you have to pass to uh, get registered that uh, you and I couldn't pass. We don't remember that section of the Constitution, you have to say, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, even voting day, well, why is voting on Tuesday? Or why isn't it on Sunday? Well, it's on Tuesday because it's a working day. So working people are going to have a hard time voting. Okay. Uh, why can't uh, people register on Sunday? Why? Because a lot of the black population goes to church on Sunday morning. And they could be they're all together in church. They could go out and get registered afterwards. Uh, we don't want to allow that. Um, they're step after step. They work very hard. They're relentless. You know, this is serious class war. You don't stop. You look at everything you can do to make sure you can win. Okay, all the way across the board. Doesn't have to happen. You know, uh, why try to destroy the postal service like Trump is trying to do? Actually, there's a lot of reasons, but one of them is you could have voting by mail. Okay, that'll get rid of a lot of these efforts to control things. Actually, there's a much deeper reason for trying to get rid of the Postal Service. It might occur to people to ask what the framers had in mind when they placed the Postal Service in the Constitution. We're supposed to revere the framers. We're supposed to revere one part of the Constitution, the Second Amendment, which is totally falsified, but I'll forget that. So we're supposed to love the Constitution, carry it under our arms. Why did the framers want a postal service? Well, there's a reason. They wanted a free press. They wanted a free, independent press. That's the way they interpreted the First Amendment. So they wanted to subsidize the press. How do you subsidize the press? Postal service. And very low rates for distribution of uh, journals and newspapers. That's most of what the Postal Service did in the early years. You don't want people to know that. And then they might start asking questions. And maybe there's something we can do through governmental structures, which will open up the country to somebody besides the rich and powerful. Now, why is it that the United States is one of the very rare countries that doesn't have public broadcasting? There's no BBC in the United States. Not that the BBC is perfect by any means, plenty of flaws, but it's much more independent than corporate media. But why doesn't the United States have, why doesn't it have radio, public radio, like every other country does? Why doesn't it have uh, television programs in which you have uh, serious discussions and debates, like say this one, other countries do? No, there are reasons. There were big battles about this major struggles about it when radio came online and later when television came online the public lost private power won but just as in the garland case it could change now there have been plenty of cases like the new deal when the public in that case led by the labor movement uh, uh, made major changes so the, the opportunities are there but you have to grasp them First of all, you have to know these things. You have to, I mean, there's very good literature on what I just said about the Postal Service. Bob McChesney is a media scholar published on it. Uh, Richard Card has a new book on it, giving a lot of detail. People aren't going to know these things unless activists work on it. And that's across the board. Everything we've been talking about, small, they look like small things maybe, but they add up. And that's why the masters are constantly at work trying to control everything. And so uh, I don't know if you know the organization, uh, ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, one of the most important organizations in the country. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a lobbying group for big business, major corporations across the board are members of it. They carry out very smart strategy. They lobby states. They try to pressure states 
to put in very reactionary legislation. Now states are, state legislators are pretty much amenable to pressure. And it doesn't take much money to win a, a, a election for the state legislature. In fact, most people don't even know who their representative is. Do you know? So they operate kind of in secret. They're easily susceptible to pressure. Now they have to make money for their next election campaign. Uh, Alec is pushing through amazing legislation at the state level. And if you do that enough, it finally becomes overwhelming. Uh, one of the things they're trying to do is destroy public education. So let's do it at the state level. Uh, you can do it step by step. Uh, one of the things they, some of the things they're doing are mind boggling. So there's a phenomenon in the United States of what's called wage theft. Employers just refuse to pay wages. Uh, they refuse to pay overtime. It's illegal, but you know, unless it's enforced, you know, can't do anything about it. So one of the ALEC efforts is to try to make it unenforceable. So no way to enforce uh, uh, stopping wage theft. This runs to billions of dollars a year of robberies of workers. Um, there is literally no stone left unturned by the masters. They're constantly at work. That one of their most insidious efforts, and they're getting pretty close to it, is to try to get a congressional amendment that will impose uh, a, a, a budget constraint, a, a, a budget constraints on the government, which says you can't, you have to keep to budgetary constraints. Okay, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you're going to stop funding the military. It means you're going to stop funding all social programs, balanced budget. You have it in many states. If you have that at the federal level, that's the end of all social programs. Okay? If you get enough states to ratify it, you could get it through. And they're getting pretty close, all in secret. I mean, not literally in secret. It's available to the public. But you don't know about it unless somebody tells you about it. You're not going to see a headline in the New York Times about it. Okay? Or Fox News, you're not going to tell you, hey, they're trying to take away all your, uh, all your social benefits. Uh, no, they're not going to tell you. But activists can tell you. We could go on with this for a long time. As I say, it's class war. The guys who have the wealth and power are working constantly everywhere to try to ensure that they can keep it and magnify it. If the rest of us let them do it, they'll do it. Wonderful. Uh, this is a great moment to segue to our publisher, Fong, who would like to ask you a question. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chomsky. Um, you brought up the Great Depression, um, which brought to my when at the time you were growing up in Philadelphia from a poor family, but you say your parents was very educated. They read many books. They went to poetry reading plays and public debate and so on. And it was a time when the emphasis on the arts and culture was the prevailing energy of humanistic tradition of inquiry that provided the people real comfort to ease the suffering of their poverty and whatnot. Um, I just wonder it now, because when you brought up the late 60s, when everyone came together and protest against the Vietnam War and, you know, civil rights movement, women rights movement and so on. And I remember reading Richard Rorty's book after September 11, even though it was written in the late 90s, called Achieving Our Country. And he, one of the few people we know, because you also mentioned John Dewey in several of your last interview, and I'm just rereading Dewey right now, all of his book, particularly his perspective of how to advocate vocational education and ad academic education being equally valued. What happened in the book 
uh, Richard Rory's book where the radical lab became cultural lab. They were sent to the academy and then there was a difference between cultural lab and reform reformist lab. So my question to you is that in which way we can, again, I, this is why we admire so much about Bernie Sanders doing to advocate for education being free. What, you know, if we don't achieve that goal, how can we inspire our academic friends and colleagues to write for, you know, working class American to begin having a real genuine conversation with them so they don't feel neglected like the way it has been for so long, which brought us to this point? Well, we could start with tomorrow. Uh, one of the leading forces in the uh, strike tomorrow are teachers. Uh, as I mentioned, teachers from uh, poor states with poor educational systems. If I happen to live in Arizona, which has the second lowest funding for education in the country, plenty of rich people in Arizona you go to Phoenix or you know, so Havens or rich people coming from the Midwest who want to be in the sun to be retired. Very reactionary, but uh, it's like the immigration that's harming Arizona is not from the south, it's from the north. But uh, put that aside. Anyway, teachers went on strike for uh, uh, here in Arizona, uh, a red state. Uh, the slogan is invest for ed, invest for education. They're not just going, I mean, salaries are ridiculously low, but they're not just calling for wages. They're calling for decent schools. Fund the schools, make it possible for children to be able to learn. Uh, that's the main thrust of the teacher strike. Uh, had some effect. Uh, it's got a lot of popular support, I should say, pretty much across a pretty broad spectrum. Uh, they've got a lot of uh, fun funding from people and so on. A lot of, you see, their signs are up all over the place. Uh, they get something out of the legislature and the government, not enough. But that's the kind of thing that can be done. That's the way you get good schools, okay? It could be done from kindergarten to university. Uh, right here it happens, the, a lot of the state legislature doesn't even see where there should be colleges. You know, just train people in business school for jobs and why well, you need all this uh, you know, crazy uh, humanities and uh, you know, philosophy and all that kind of nonsense, uh, which just is subversion. You know, we don't want that. Uh, I think probably the one thing that the state funds is probably the uh, Freedom Center established by the Koch brothers to teach uh, right wing propaganda. But, uh, but the rest of the university, none of their business. But it can be changed. You know, people live in the state. If they want their children to have a decent education, they can work for it. And some can do it. And in fact, it's changing you know, in interesting ways. So, but, uh, and similar things are true around the country. So I think the answer to your question is the same as the answer to all questions. You know. So do you think, do you think, sir, that now that we've been forced down because of the pandemic, in other words, Trump's greatest ability is to mobilize speed as his power, something he learned from Mussolini. But now we are being forced to slow down because nature needs to heal her body. Wouldn't this be a good opportunity for us to mobilize, advocate for slowness, which is the old art of, of patient, respectful time? Hurrying everything has been so detrimental to the position of humanist inquiry. So this is the time which we can write a poem, make a painting, conversation like this is the one solution that we can really um, use as an agent against Trump. Exactly. I mean, we happen to be in forced isolation, mm -hmm. but you know, in the modern world, plenty of people have ways to communicate. You know, almost everybody has a smartphone or something. Uh, yeah. So there's lots of ways of interacting. 
and it can be used for educational purposes uh, and for organization. You can organize through social media. You can work out plans, yeah. you can start pressing for them. In fact, we can do it right now, even in the electoral arena. Yeah. One of the things that Sanders is doing right now, apparently, is trying to press the party leadership for more progressive programs and the uh, formal program of the party. Well, you can say those are just words, who cares? That they don't have to be just words. You can keep their feet to the fire if they're elected with constant protest and activism, kind of thing the Sunrise Movement did, the Amazon workers did. You can always do that. There are lots of opportunities for all of us. I mean, part of the propaganda that we're fed is you're, ho you're helpless. You can't do anything. That's what Thatcher meant with her famous statement saying, there's no society. You're just individuals tossed into the marketplace, helpless, try to protect yourself. Uh, you can have a copy of Ayn Rand and say, oh, try to beat everyone else up and get rich. Okay. Uh, but you're not allowed to work together. Okay. It's not true. In fact, we see it very dramatically right in front of our eyes. Let's take a look at what uh, doctors and nurses are doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, real heroism. Yeah. They're working day and night, very dangerous conditions. Yes. They don't have equipment because of the malevolence of the government, but uh, they're doing it. You take a look around at communities around the country and around the world. A lot of them are self-organizing. The community groups are forming to you know, help out some uh, uh, disabled guy who can't get food at home or okay. something else. It's happening all over the world. Not, I mean, it's happening to, not I'm, go back to Jeremy uh, earlier question, the first one being about civil, civilian, civilian culture. In other words, we too can mobilize and retool technology in our advantage if we know how to subvert it. And yeah. that's what we're trying to do in the social environment. Yes. So and to learn, to learn how is not difficult. We can start with simple things. Uh, one of some of the best mobilizing I've ever seen, uh, really effective is in, I lived in Boston most of my life, was in a poor area of Boston, mostly immigrant area. Uh, okay. Few organizers started to try to bring people together who feel helpless, can't do anything. They tried to convince uh, mothers, group of mothers, well, let's see if we can get a, if we can convince the city council to put up a traffic light in a place where kids have to walk to school. So they got together, uh, you know, city council, they finally got a traffic light. That teaches you something. To get together, you can do things. That's let's right. go on to the next one. Okay. That's Thank the way the civil rights movement began. Yep. Yeah. A couple of black students sit in a uh, they were with lunch counter, you know, get arrested. Could have ended it. It didn't because some more came back the next day. Uh, and some white students joined. Pretty soon you had feeder riders going through the South trying to get uh, black farmers to vote in very dangerous conditions. They could be murdered, many were. But it finally got somewhere. Well, again, not as far as we'd like, but it got somewhere. Significant. That's the way everything happens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for about two more questions. Is that good with you, Mr. Chomsky? Yeah. Great. So <laughs> next, we will go over to Justin, who had a question about um, parliamentary system. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, Justin? Uh, it's, well, I will go to the next question while I wait to figure out this. Um, next we have John. John Sullivan, I'm going to unmute you. Hi. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Noam, for the great talk. Um, my question was just about uh, sin uh, Sino-American relations. The president has been using increasingly hostile rhetoric against China during this pandemic, and I'd just like to know how concerned do you think we should be about uh, deteriorating relations between the United States and China in the coming decades? Well, let's notice that the deteriorations are one-sided. We're the U.S. government, not you and me, but the guys around Trump and his circles are desperately seeking to try to blame China for their own crimes. Uh, take a look at the press this morning. Big articles on how uh, the White House is planning all sorts of attacks on China and mobilize the population so that everybody's going to rise up against China because look what they did to us. We're all locked up with China's fault. Is it China's fault? No, it's not. By January 10th, with extreme rapidity, China had, Chinese scientists had found the source of the pandemic and given the information to the entire world. Many countries reacted, okay, and are in pretty good shape. This one, this country, betrayed its own population more than anyone else. Now they're trying to cover up for it. Does that mean China was perfect? No, a lot wrong with China. But that's not why they're going after China. They're going after China because it was successful. Uh, why? You should take a look at the programs, the Trump programs, uh, to the tariffs and the rest of it. They actually say what they're doing. It's not secret. We have to prevent China's technological development. Okay? Well, the United States happens to be quite backward in uh, uh, internet facilities. But where I live happens to be a couple of miles out of town. So there's very weak signals. Well, there's a, country, there's a company in the world called Huawei, which has top flight cheap equipment. Uh, they're going all over the world installing it. But we've got to prevent them from developing. I mean, obviously we can't let people here use it, but we've also got to hamper their development. And we've got to, China is way in the lead in producing uh, sophisticated solar panels and wind turbines and electrification of vehicles, way ahead of the rest of the world. We've got to stop that. We don't want them to succeed in doing that because it might just help people, but it might harm the US power and corporate profits. So let's prevent them from developing. Look, I'm not extolling China. We could spend two hours talking about hideous things that are going on in China, we could. But that's not what all this is about. It's about preventing the successes. You know, take a look right now. There's two countries in the world which are acting uh, effectively to help others. Now, Germany is a rich country. Now, they've got the situation pretty much under control. A couple of miles from Germany in northern Italy is a raging pandemic. Is, China, is Germany helping them? There's something called a European Union. Is Germany helping them? No. But they are getting help from Cuba. Cuba sending doctors, the way it's done for many years. And Cuba is under the heels of the United States. They're trying to crush it for 60 years, ever since Kennedy. You know, crushing sanctions, terrorism, somehow they survived. They're the one model of genuine internationalism in the world. So they're sending doctors to uh, Northern Italy with Chinese help. And China's providing also doctors with lots of equipment. This is happening all over the world. Do you see any other countries doing it? Does that tell you something? Yeah, something to think about. So, uh, uh, in fact, the United, one of the arguments today, if you look at the press, against trying to punish China is that we need them because they're sending us materials that we need to try to control the pandemic that raged out of control because of our crimes. Now we have to ask China for help to provide equipment. Okay? 
so we got to be careful about punishing them. But uh, we should remember that in the United States, there's something called the yellow peril. It goes way back to the 19th century. The Chinese are going to come over here and destroy us. And we have to wipe them out with bacteriological warfare. Uh, this keeps being revived. Uh, the 1950s, uh, when I was your age, the, the Chinese are planning uh, to destroy America. You know, the Red Chinese are doing this and that. It's easy to arouse this among the American population. It's a deep-seated racist fear of those Chinese, horrible Chinese. Uh, now it's being revived again to improve Trump's electoral prospects. That's the only reason. No other reason. Doesn't even help corporations. Harms their supply chains. Of course, they're willing to tolerate it because the guy in the White House uh, pours wealth into their pockets beyond the dreams of avarice. So they'll tolerate these antics too. But they don't like it. They don't want it. Uh, what, what it is is an effort to get the gangsters reelected. And they'll do anything for that. Kill a lot of black Africans. Uh, throw children into concentration camps, uh, uh, whatever, they kill a lot of Americans, uh, whatever you think, anything to get reelected. In fact, we see it so obviously right in front of us, it takes genius to miss it. Uh, take Trump's latest tactic. Uh, it's all a problem of the government. We can't do anything. Federal government happens to have all the resources, uh, you know, all the wealth, but we can't do anything. But you do it, the governors. You don't have the resources, you don't have the opportunities, you can't make deals with South Korea, we can. Uh, but uh, you, it's your problem. What lies behind that tactic? It's pure sadism, but what lies behind the tactic? Pretty obvious. If anything goes wrong, which it will, since we're making it harder, if anything goes wrong, we can blame it on the governors. Mitch McConnell can come in and say it's all the blue states. You know, it's because they waste money on uh, uh, pensions for firefighters and teachers and all that kind of nonsense. Now it's their problem, Mitch McConnell. Okay. So if anything goes wrong with the virus, it's the governor's fault, especially the blue states. If anything happens to work by accident, the Trump can say, look what a genius I am. And Sean Hannity will say, you know, greatest figure in human history. You can't lose as long as the population stays subordinate and doesn't see what is right before their eyes, which is not easy. Nobody's telling it to you. It takes a little work to notice it. That's what activists are for. People like you lift the veil, get people to see what's before their eyes, make it understandable that they don't have to accept it. They can change it. Power's in their hands. You know? Goes back to one of the first books of modern political science by the great philosopher David Hume, the First Principles of Government. Open it up, first paragraph. Power is in the hands of the governed, those who are governed. Power can maintain itself only by forcing consent. Okay, important words. Power is in the hands of the people. They have to consent to subordinate themselves to knights and princes and corporate managers and so on. And it's a thin system of control. It's very fragile. You expose it to sunlight, it evaporates. And that's the job of activists. And there's plenty of opportunity. I think that's the thing to keep in mind. And for me, I have to keep in mind that I have another appointment coming up. <laughs> um, if, if you'd like, we can transition to the poem now. You've been very generous with your time and we appreciate it very much. Um, I'm sorry to all the questions we weren't able to get to today. Um, hopefully in the future there will be more opportunities. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce Zoe Hitzig, who will be our poet today. Zoe Hitzig um, has a book forthcoming called Mezzanine that will be out in June. Zoe, I'm going to unmute you now. Thank you so much, Sophia, and thank you 
to the Brooklyn Rail and Noam for an amazing conversation. It's a true honor to share this virtual space with someone like Noam, who has so deeply influenced my thinking, both in my poetry and in my scholarship. I'll be reading a poem called Silent Auction, as Sophia mentioned, from my forthcoming book called Mezzanine. And it's actually one of three poems in the book that has this title. Silent Auction. Please let me tell you what it is to make market. Paint the sky purple K, hospital gown blue, parents house violet, daub above the muddied river I can see from my purchase where I'm writing now. Pretty pricing patterns contain damning dispatches. Think of the market as your rain. It is rain, high frequency rain, and there is never a highest bidder. It is bullets blown to sky and deflected, high frequency bullets filling the sea with their shells. Pick this one, pick high frequency, pick no one. You are in bed with your stun gun. We have a market failure. We prepare to cover the sky in sodium bicarbonate. We already have empire. Let us make market here, where? The huddling audience bids against us. The other side is shadows. The huddling audience bids against us, against time, against blueprint. The negative space is time. It is not enough to press into vellum and displace natural dye. Vellum that came from ancient mammoth. That mammoth ate stellar gas. At noontime, being too large, noon for him is always. Be too large, amortize the sun. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Zoe. What a wonderful way to close an excellent conversation. It's, it's been a pleasure to have you, Mr. Chomsky. Paul, we, Thank hope to, you. we hope to see you again soon. We uh, hold this talk daily at 1 p.m. Um, and tomorrow we will have the artist Raha, Raha, Raha Iznia um, and we have many more exciting guests next week. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chomsky. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. No, thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'll have to leave. Yeah. Yes. Take care. Take care of yourself. Thank you, Nam.